Um, I've been um, an academic for, you know, like 30 years or something, working on a whole series of, of topics. I'm based in Oxford. We have a research group that is very applied. We're focusing on Africa. We're also focusing these days on trying to understand what better we can do with refugees, Syrian refugees in Lebanon and Jordan, um, working on cash transfers there and trying to see whether things like um, psychological interventions may actually be helpful to get these people economically empowered uh, in these settings. And indeed, a lot of what we do is actually thinking about um, how can we get people we're working with, poor people in Africa, how can we get them empowered to take charge of their own lives. So when people ask me to talk about the prize of economic empowerment, I'm very happy to do it. Let me actually briefly give a, a bit of background. I'm talking already as saying poor people. One thing and one big misconception is, is that the world is getting a worse place all the time. Actually, it is just one of these remarkable things that in these 30, 35 years that I've been interested in working on development, this has probably been a real privilege to be part of the fastest improvement in extreme poverty that the world has ever seen. You know, if we go back to the beginning of the 19th century, then probably something like 94% um, of people were poor. It's a bit hard to reconstruct it, but 94% of the world population was actually poor. How do we assess that? Well, we try to put it relative to some particular line, some particular extent that people uh, need to have a minimal acceptable life um, in terms of nutrition, in terms of food and purchases. If we use that same benchmark, then actually by about 1960, it was still about 44%. Okay? And it had gone down quite dramatically, I should actually correct, it's actually about 60% by then. It had gone down very dramatically, but it took a long time. Actually, since about 1980, when poverty was about 44%, it's gone down really fast, and now it's less than 10% of the global population. Now, and this is not just in this kind of income poverty that may be a bit hard to measure in the whole thing. Look at any indicator. This has been the 30, 40 years of the fastest progress in human history. Now, it doesn't mean there are no poor people left. There's still more than 700 people, uh, the 700, 700 million people that actually are below this kind of minimal acceptable level. Look, this is an extremely low level. There's loads of people who are very vulnerable, that are still living on very meager incomes and for whom getting the next meal is actually also not entirely clear. And, and some event that happens in their life, it's a big thing. Where are these people? Well, it's interesting. When we go back about 30, 35 years ago, and we would actually put all poor people in a hat. Oh, it's totally unethical, I know. But just imagine it. You put them all in a, in a hat. And you put one random poor person and you check their passport. Well, if they had one, it would show that the most likely per passport you would have picked 35 years ago would have been a Chinese passport. If you go back to roughly now, and it's actually been like that for easily the last uh, 15, 20 years, if not more, if you do the same thing, put all poor, extreme poor people in a hat and you take them out and check their passport, they will actually have an Indian passport. We know now, though, that with current patterns, and it's very unlikely that these patterns are not going to move, move like that, in about 15 years, if we take this random poor person, they are definitely going to be African, and it's either going to be someone from the DRC or from Nigeria. And that's another thing you need to know about poverty, is that more and more extreme poverty is going to be really in very tough places, and very much harder, and we're not quite sure what it will be. But it doesn't mean that we don't have a sense of how all this poverty went down. Poverty went down rather dramatically, not to charitable giving, sorry. It wasn't like that. That's not what the biggest driver was. The biggest driver in the end was economic progress, economic growth that actually created jobs for people and gave them an income, economic growth that actually allowed services to be established and much for better quality health and education services and other services for poor people. But it doesn't mean that aid and charitable giving has had very little impact or that it doesn't have a clear role looking forward either. And probably the best way of thinking about it is that these economic pro uh, processes are pretty messy things. 
You know, they go and a lot of people stay behind and are not included in this process. And the way I would like to think about many of these, um, you know, the things we're trying to do when we are working in development is to actually make sure that the process goes faster, that it's more equal, that it's more inclusive of poor people. And I think there's a huge amount of work still to be done. And in lots of places, there's lots that, uh, that should be done. And this is what I'm also thinking of when I talk about economic empowerment. You know, can we make the poorest people take part in this progress that is happening? Or can we help the progress to start taking place that also these poor people can, be, uh, can, can make forward? So what can we do about this? So what can we actually do and how can we speed this up? So there's been a long tradition of NGOs, of charitable foundations, or indeed governments of trying to find ways of doing this. And so on this, this respect, quite a few things have changed in, in recent times. You know, we used to have a long, obvious list of things that we would be doing. And, you know, when I started, everyone was saying, oh, well, just, you know, a lot of poor people are farmers, so surely the thing to do is just make them better farmers. And just getting some fertilizer, getting some skills, getting some tools, and that's probably what we do. Let's send the goat there, let's send the cow there, and it's all sorted. And this kind of very easy ideas of actually responding in very simple ways. We also started doing things like, oh, well, clearly, um, you know, surely Richard Branson, I was just sitting in front of a quote there that, uh, of uh, Mr. Branson, you know, he's a very successful person. He said essentially something like, you know, ev everyone has an inter entrepreneur on them. It's just a matter of making sure we unlock the opportunities. And so people have been saying, surely that's the way to do it. And let's make sure we'll give them the finance, the microfinance, and we're going to go and do it. So other people will talk more about it. These are things. Or indeed, we've been trying to teach lots of people skills and try to make pro progress. Now, one of the key lessons of recent decades or 15 years or so is that actually an awful lot of things that sound good on paper and sound good on leaflets, and sound good when you have a poster up or a little clip on uh, TV and whatever, actually they're not necessarily that effective. And we'll hear more maybe also about things like microcredit. Um, but it is something there, some of these things that are most easily sold and surely seem to be a great thing. Surely, you know, give, make empower poor people, give them access to credit. Surely they can start running their business. Surely that will be the way out. Actually, the evidence is much more nuanced. And I use the word evidence. And evidence is one of the big things that has changed in the last 10, 15 years. Is that actually, rather than actually saying, it sounds good, surely it must be right. And we'll go and f find somewhere a poor woman or a poor man and ask them, oh, well, you know, you got credit. Did it work for you? And well, after a bit of looking, you'll find a poor woman or a poor man that tells you a great story of how it improved their life. But that's not the same and to conclude that actually it works. It works on average, it works at scale, it works for everyone. And that's actually the important thing. So what's something we've been started to do is to actually bring research in a very applied way onto the ground and actually carefully test using impact evaluations, using really evaluating very, very carefully whether with the best signs that we have, are these things working? Are these things making a difference for people? And um, it's not easy. It's not just like, oh, well, um, it's a bit like you know, popping a pill and then we can observe you whether your fever goes down. We are working in societies that are complicated. And as I said, this society is getting even more difficult and so on where these poor people are operating. It's really difficult to get the good signs, but it is really important. And we are learning. We are getting a much better idea of what is actually having an impact. And also, really importantly, in my job in a, in a, in a government department, all the things that are quite a waste of money. Very useful to know what doesn't work. And so we can actually go away from just things that are just a good story. I don't have anything against stories, but I like them to be true. And so we can try to make sure we tell the stories, but largely on the, the things that are truthful and not that are imaginary and that sell well. So what can we do? Well, we can do all kinds of new things and we can try. And this is actually something I think Research and evidence has been very important because it can help us to innovate and do new things. So where do you all fit in then? Well, all the time now, we've been able to make the beginnings of a sense of the kind of things that are actually quite effective. Sometimes we know they're effective in some places, not always that we know that they are working everywhere else, but we can speed up 
uh, the whole process. And I think that's a really important part of charitable donations, to actually start supporting the things that are, that are effective, that are actually making a difference, and actually help to either try them out in new settings or try them out to scale them up. It helps to show governments what actually are good things. And by actually trying things out and actually show that they are worthwhile to be done at bigger scale by others. It can show entrepreneurs and those involved in firms and enterprises, social enterprises, for example, of what other kind of things they should be trying. It helps to get you new frontiers, it get a clear sense of what actually are the right things to do. And I think charitable giving is really central to that because it can take a bit more risk, it can try to take new things and it can try out things. The final thing, and I know my time is up, is to simply say, whoever, whoever you ever want to give to, be skeptical. And question, and ask so many questions about what you know whether these things actually are working or not. And then finally, just be aware that humility is important in my business in working on development. It's really hard uh, to actually be successful in bringing poverty down and do it quicker and better. Humility is really important. And I hope that also you can have respect that actually reality sometimes is a bit more complicated than just a place with lots of silver bullets. There are no silver bullets in this business. Thank you.